Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come here together and uh, be together as a community and uh, worship you in everything we do. We pray that you uh, open our eyes and our hearts to anything you have for us tonight to hear. Uh, we pray that you, that you be with those who are not able to be with us here tonight, who are sick or injured. I uh, pray that you nurse them back to the health that you uh, would have them to be. And I uh, pray that you be with us as we go through everything that we do and uh, remember you in everything. And uh, thank you for everything you've done. Pray these things in your name. Amen. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, buried in the sacred seeking to rise. Tonight, I'll be reading the book of 1 John, chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. It says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, restful afternoon and, and uh, got a little nap in, um, get refreshed for, for this evening. Uh, I had one quick announcement and had someone uh, remind us, uh, remind me, that there's a lunar eclipse tonight. And uh, it's one of those things that uh, only comes around every, every so often. And if you wanted to uh, look at the marvelous handiwork of God in our universe, uh, that's one of those things. It's actually quite fascinating if you look at the uh, uh, apologetics 
and the earth and the moon and it's in their interaction it's actually a pretty awesome thing looking at how carefully the moon was designed for the earth and it's going around and controlling various things on our on our planet it really is pretty amazing and so tonight you can get a glimpse of a little bit of that uh, in the evening sky well uh, we're going to look at uh, the issue of sin tonight and I've called it cosmic treason because uh, well that phrase is not unique to me um, it is something that really does have much farther reaching consequences than I think we tend to realize and when we look at the issue of sin it's something that's incredibly important uh, as important as anything else that we've that we've studied in our in our series on on Sunday nights there was a fellow by the name of Edwin Cooper. Most people didn't know him by that name, but this is a fellow who uh, came from a family of circus clowns. And he was a member of the Barnum and Bailey Circus for a while, would, would do that for, for uh, uh, while the circus was touring, and then in his off times he would, he would serve as a clown in, in other places. And uh, for many of us, I think uh, we would be much more familiar with the name Bozo the Clown. Uh, this is, uh, of course, not just one person, but a series of individuals who, uh, who served uh, in that particular capacity. Actually, uh, Chris and I, where we went to school, uh, one of the ladies who was in the education department, her husband had served as one of the Bozos the Clowns um, uh, in, his, in his career. But, uh, but this fellow, uh, most, that's how most people knew him. Uh, they didn't know him by his, by his uh, given name. And every uh, so often he would remind his buddies and partners about the importance of cancer and, uh, and how dangerous it was. And it was a really uh, tragically sad irony that that is exactly what took his life. He was only uh, 41 years old and he'd warned so many people about that. And yet it was the very thing that uh, did him in. And when we look at sin, sin is far deadlier and far more dangerous than any cancer. Uh, it grows just like one. It destroys everything that it touches. You look at Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the rest of Scripture. And the entire story of Scripture takes that into account. It is touched and impacted by the sin of individuals from the Garden in Eden until now. And it is as unrelenting and as unforgiving as anything that you can imagine. Well, this is why Jesus in John chapter 10, he talks about the thief, right? It says a thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy and when we look at Satan in that light, that is exactly what he does. And that's exactly what sin does. And that is precisely why we have to study topics like this. Because the nature of sin is to be concealed. It is to escape detection. And so that's why we have to, to talk about it. That's not a very popular topic. That's not something that people really get excited about. Um, and it's not something that uh, is preached on very often, uh, at least uh, in, in some places today. But it needs to be, because that is the one, I think, most important besetting problem for the human race. Not only for what it is, but for what it does. It ruptures our relationship with our Creator and complicates our lives in, in just innumerable ways. But essentially, uh, we're going to define sin tonight as basically being in a wrong relationship with God. Right? Doing something that is harmful or injurious to our relationship with our Creator. And there's one passage in Scripture, and uh, the passage itself, I guess, would probably a little, be a little bit surprising from where it comes from. Uh, or maybe not, I don't know, it depends on, on how well you know your Old Testament, but... There's one passage in the book of Isaiah, and it's in Isaiah chapter 53, and it's verse 6. Now, normally we think of that section, as soon as you say that, you immediately think, oh, well, that's the passage of the suffering servant, right? That's, that's the passage that sometimes gets read at the communion talks and uh, is, is referenced around 
Easter time and, and things like that. Um, but there's one verse that really, I think, sort of captures what sin is. And that's in verse 6. It says, We all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And I think that's a pretty good encapsulation of what sin is. Uh, sheep are not intelligent animals, right? That's what we're compared to in the Old Testament quite a bit, and the New Testament quite a bit. Um, so it's a little bit humbling, you know, to think of ourselves in that way. But that's what sheep do, right? They, they wander off. They get into trouble. They have to go get rescued, right? Jesus tells stories about this. But the thing is, sheep kind of, when they do this, they're, they're doing what they want, all right? They're, they're, they're wandering off. They're, they're going the direction they want to go instead of the direction the shepherd wants them to go. And for us as human beings, that really sort of captures sin in, in who we are, right? We're doing what we want. We're, we're kind of going the, a different direction than what God wants us to go. And so that sort of sums it up. But there's, there's some basic points that I want to make. Uh, and that is that sin involves deception. Sin involves denial. And ultimately, sin is kind of like the worship of a false god. And at the very end, we'll talk about some, some real life applications because that's what we're, what we're doing here on, on, on Sunday nights in this series. Like, what does that look like? You know, what, what, what do, when we realize these things, what does it look like? How do we detect this? And then also, how do we try to escape the consequences of sin? So, so we'll, we'll talk about that at the end. Uh, but the first thing, sin involves deception. That's, that's a, a basic feature of what sin uh, is and what it involves. You, again, you go back to Genesis chapter 3, there is deception involved. Uh, you know, the serpent doesn't come up and say, hey, if you eat that fruit, it's going to be awful for you and the rest of the history of the human race. Adam and Eve wouldn't have eaten the fruit, right? I mean, that you don't lead with that. That's not a good sales pitch. What do you do? You take what God says and you tweak it, you twist it. You have just enough truth where it sounds believable, but just enough of a lie where it gets you, right? And so that's, that's, how, he, that's how he does it. You know, hey, you eat this fruit, you're not going to die. You're going to be like God. You're going to know good from evil. Yeah, that's true. You are going to know the difference between good and evil because that's what it does. But you're not going to die? Well, that's not, the, that's, that's not so much the case. And then uh, when you read through the story, I mean, even, even Eve says, I was deceived. You know, I've, I've been hoodwinked. Um, I've had one pulled over on me here. And that could be said for most sins, I think. Uh, there's some kind of uh, deception that's, that's involved there, and we have to be on the lookout for that kind of thing. That's why Jesus, in John chapter 8, very famous verse, verse 44, uh, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So you know, we, we know this. This is how Satan operates. This is how the devil does his, his, his deeds. But sin is powerful. Um, it is. Uh, it's persuasive. It's addictive. All of these things are true. But it's also elusive. And I think because it so often sort of uh, flies under the radar, we tend to uh, underestimate it quite a bit. Now, if it's so deadly, though, okay, it, it ruins our relationship with our Creator, it can ruin our lives. Why is it so attractive? Why do so many people buy in? And I think that's where you have to look at the fact that it involves deception. There are a lot of products that if you advertise them, uh, the truth about them up front, people would never do it, right? It's like cigarette commercials. If you, you showed a, a commercial and in the, in the, in the commercial was a picture of a, 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 an interview with a person dying from lung cancer, you would never smoke a pack of cigarettes. You know, if you uh, had a, uh, a beer commercial, and that commercial was someone uh, who had uh, been uh, molested at a party, had, had gotten blasted out of her mind, and, and was molested as a result of it, or, or, or you talk to the parents of somebody who died in, a, in a, a car crash, no one would ever drink beer. Um, the, you know, you don't have truth in advertising. That's how sin works. You, you, you conceal it, you, you hide it, you... you uh, you hide those consequences, and that's how it sells. Well, uh, we also underestimate our ability to handle it. 
You know, we, we, we maybe think of ourselves as, well, you know, I'm in Christ. You know, I've got the armor of God. Uh, you know, uh, one little, as, as uh, was it, a mighty fortress is our God. One little word will fell him, uh, Martin Luther wrote. Um, not so much. I mean, you look at the history of the human race, and that tends to not how it works out, right? Um, but uh, we, we underestimate our ability to be able to withstand or to handle or, or prevent ourselves from committing sin. You may have something that looks like a good thing, and it's really not. Right? The, uh, the deception aspect is it looks like a good thing. Uh, conventional wisdom says that it's okay. Right? God's word may have something different. But, you know, people are doing it. It, it looks good. It sounds fun. And so you get sold that way. Now, uh, you, you look at the, the ways that you could accomplish something good through sin, right? You don't tell somebody the truth because you want to spare their feelings. You, you think about sexual purity outside of marriage. Is it really that important? Because I can think of some things that, well, maybe it would help finding a mate, right? They would help figure out if, if you're really compatible with that person or not. That's kind of an important part of marriage. Uh, do we always have to do what's right all the time? Aren't there some times we could like bend the rules a little bit, maybe uh, uh, kind of you know, uh, do that and then, and then maybe be a little selfish sometimes? Isn't that okay? You know, can't we do that? And the thing is though, what happens if you get a taste for it? Sin's kind of a, a progressive thing. Um, it sort of takes hold. It gets a little toe hold. And it gets a little hand hold. And then it gets a bigger hold on us. And we get a taste. And it just sort of grows from there. It just sort of snowballs. Well, sin does deceive. It is deceptive. That's, a, that's a, a, an important component of it. And we have to realize that the reason why it is so attractive. The reason why deception is such an important part of it is the devil doesn't play fair. And he doesn't have to. He plays by his rules. He's a devil. <laughs> He's not going to play by God's rules. That's what got him in trouble to begin with. And that's what gets us in trouble when we follow suit. That's part of the nature of sin. Well, not only does sin involve deception, it also involves denial. And so uh, you know, we look at the fact that all of us, all of us make mistakes. Right? There's no doubt about that. And, and no one likes that, right? No one likes to make mistakes. No one likes to feel like a failure. No one likes to come up short or miss the mark or miss the, 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 the goal. We don't like to get caught red-handed. I don't like to get our hand caught in the cookie jar. But we do it. We do it a lot. But we don't want to admit it. And sometimes the person we don't want to, to admit it to the most is that person that looks back at us in the mirror every morning. Now, uh, we don't want to admit the truth for a variety of reasons, right? Maybe it means that our reputation is going to suffer if we have to admit to something, right? Maybe it means that uh, we're going to be humiliated in front of people. People are going to know, right? Because one of the worst things is having people find out that you did something naughty right? And so uh, you don't want that. You don't want to be humiliated in front of people. And maybe it's because we've already lied so much and compounded the problem so much that it's become such a bigger problem that if we actually have to fess up and tell the truth, all of our lies are going to become unraveled and we're going to be exposed. And, you know, sometimes you, you get to the point you're not so sure you can tell the truth because you've become way too invested in all the lies that you've had to tell. Well, we have to be honest with ourselves. Right? That's, that's part of, of combating sin and dealing with sin in our lives. We have to be honest. And um, we, we might uh, uh, be quick to say, you know, okay, yeah, I understand. I'm flawed. I make mistakes. Nobody's perfect. But is that really being honest? Is that, is that complete honesty? That's, that's sort of like a facade of honesty. It's sort of like a veneer of honesty because we can say that as kind of an excuse, can't we? Well, you know, okay, I messed up. Oh, nobody's perfect, okay. Um, yeah, I made a mistake, but who has it? Who hasn't made one? Right? It sometimes sounds like an excuse. And it's a long way away from admitting that we are sinners 
that we are desperately in need of God's grace and we are lost without Jesus Christ. That's a long way away from that. It's sort of like saying, uh, somebody who has stage four cancer and they say, yeah, yeah I guess, I, you know, the doctor said I'm, I'm sick. You know, no, it's, it's much more serious than that. And that's kind of how sin is. We have to be honest with it and honest with ourselves. Now, the, the third thing here is sin is uh, worship of a false god. Um, god is supposed to be a number one priority in our lives. And when Jesus talks about um, what you and I do, how we're supposed to live, Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. It's not ours, it's not what I want to do or what some guru says or anything like that. What is God defined? What is God's kingdom? Why do we want to be there? What is God's righteousness? Why do we want to do that? Well, these are questions we have to answer. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah, when he was preaching to the, uh, the southern kingdom, he was working sometime in the late 600s, around the 620s or so, and the northern kingdom had already been gone. Right? It had already been taken off into, into captivity. Uh, almost 100 years at that point. Uh, North, the Assyrians had come in, uh, taken off the northern kingdom. Uh, at this point, Assyria was on life support, and the Babylonians were about to take over, and Jeremiah is warning them, that things are in store, right, if, if you don't repent. And so throughout the book of Jeremiah, he refers to the spiritual adultery of, of, of the people. And this, uh, as you guys have heard me mention before, adultery in the ancient world was a crime punishable by death. Right? They took marital fidelity really seriously, uh, <laughs> much more seriously than we do, obviously. And... That very serious image is what Jeremiah chooses to portray spiritual unfaithfulness to God. It was not something that was a oh, little mistake, ah, oh, this is a slip up. It was infidelity. I mean, as, as disgusting and as foreign as it would be to those of us who were married to, to cheat on our spouse. That is how disgusting it was for God to watch his people chase after Baal and El and Asherah and all of these other gods of the Ammonites, Moabites, Philistines, Edomites, Assyrians, Babylonians. I mean, there are some mentioned by name by the prophets. Uh, Baal or Marduk uh, is one that's, that's mentioned. Nebo is another one that's mentioned. Tammuz is another one that Ezekiel mentions. These, these false gods are the ones that all of God's people are going after and chasing after and, and having re, you know, spiritual religious services commemorating uh, events from, from pagan mythology. And so this is a very serious thing. This is the, the seriousness of how God sees this. Is that he uses the image of, of, of adultery to describe what the God's people are doing. And the thing is, you have various descriptions that are given in um, the prophet Isaiah, in Jeremiah, and they are very unflattering. Uh, Ezekiel has one. They are incredibly unflattering. In fact, the one in Ezekiel, uh, it was not read in synagogues. It was excluded from the order of worship in synagogues because it was so unflattering to the people that they just didn't read it. It was that, it was that convicting uh, and, and offensive, but Jeremiah, and Isaiah has one as well, but Jeremiah has one here, says, and you, O desolate one, what do you mean that you dress in scarlet, that you adorn yourself with ornaments of gold, that you enlarge your eyes with paint? In vain you beautify yourself, your lovers despise you, they seek your life. Well, he's describing false gods here, and the thing is about false gods, False gods don't love you. They want to destroy you. That's how false gods work. And these are the very things that Israel was chasing after, relentlessly, breathlessly chasing after these false deities when this is what they wanted to do. And, he, of course, he describes it like, a, like a, a woman who is beautifying herself for her lover, and really all, they, all he wants to do is, is to murder her. 
And that's what false gods do. Well, uh, we, uh, we might look back and say, yes, yes, Dwayne, you've showed us pictures of Baal and some of these other gods, these little statues and all that. We don't have little statues today. No, but they do take different other forms. <laughs> uh, it might be your career, it might be your relationship, it might be money, it might be a possession. It could be any number of things. It doesn't have to be a little statue of wood covered with gold or stone or some inscription or carving or anything like that. That's what people did in the ancient world. We're more refined and sophisticated today. Well, you will never hear a false god tell you, well done, my good and faithful servant. You will never hear that from a false god. What you will hear is, why didn't you do more? Why didn't you go farther? Why didn't you give me more? I need one more thing. Do you not love me? Why not? What have I done to deserve less than your best? You are such a disappointment. That is what you hear from false gods. They will never congratulate you on a job well done. They will only criticize you and express disappointment on a job never done well enough. That's what false gods do. When you and I choose something other than God, and we put it in his place, we set it on his throne, we're choosing to honor the creation rather than the creator. And it will never, never love you like Christ does. So, imagine, I want us to imagine something for a minute. Um, we, uh, uh, you, you may know uh, John Lennon's song, Imagine. It was the best-selling single of his career. And the thing is, it's being used today in a lot of ways uh, by some atheists because it, it's kind of an anthem. And there's one very specific part that also makes it uh, controversial, right? Uh, because it gets played a lot. And it's this one section that, that, is, that is what really kind of gets people stirred up. But he says, imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for and no religion to. Right? And because of that, that's sort of an anthem for unbelief. And uh, it's very popular. Of course, John Lennon, a uh, very popular artist, member of the Beatles. Uh, some people consider them the greatest musical act of all time. Um, John Lennon had a solo career, as some of the Beatles did, and there's even a monument uh, to him in his honor in the city of Liverpool. And of course, whenever you have somebody who's famous, who is a wordsmith, uh, their words do tend to make it into popular jargon and in uh, you know, common wisdom and that kind of thing. And this phrase, or sort of adapted from his song, I saw one time in a, a picture on the internet, and it's just, uh, imagine no religion, right? And of course, you've got the sun peeking out from in between the, the Twin Towers. Of course, we could say, imagine no violent religions, and you'd have, you'd have exactly this, right? That's, that's, how, that's how that would work. But um, I, I appreciate the sentiments. I, I appreciate maybe the goal that, that John Lennon had. Um, I, I, I don't his way of getting there was impossible, right? His, his, his vision in this song, if you go back and you read the lyrics, his vision in this song is sort of a humanistic, uh, secularized utopia where everyone gets along and it's magically wonderful all the time. And that, to me, is something that could never, ever possibly exist in the real world. This is a dream, this is an ideal that is absolutely unreachable. But the thing is, I'm going to ask you to do something similar. And I'm going to ask you to do something that is infinitely more realistic. All right? So let's imagine. Imagine a world where people follow the teachings of the New Testament. Not, not, the, not the secularized, humanized, you know, nowhere land that Lenin is talking about, but something that's doable something that is reachable, drawn from the pages of the New Testament. Now, let's see 
Imagine a world where everyone fights against the destructive tendencies of sin. Imagine a world where everyone fights sin, combats it, recognizes it, sees it for the enemy that it is, sees it for the problems that it poses, understands the consequences that result, and they fight it. Imagine that kind of world. Imagine a world where we stop lying about sins to save face, and we're honest about our failings. We're genuine people. We're authentic people. I know a fellow, I've worked for a fellow for a while. He burned about every bridge he could possibly burn in his life because he was dishonest, he was a thief, he was incredibly arrogant. And because of all of these things, when people got wise to him and saw him for what he really was, he would try to defend himself. He was very arrogant about it. He was very rude. Uh, he was very insulting and tried to paint himself as kind of sort of a white knight uh, that, that he was being unfairly persecuted and criticized by people who were jealous of him. What this fellow did was isolate himself from almost everybody. And he still has a core of loyal followers and devotees. But imagine, imagine this fellow, if he were to be open and honest and just say, you know what, guys, for years I've been living these lies and I made these mistakes, I committed these sins against people, and I understand that this is not what God wants for me, and I've been an embarrassment to Christ, I've been an embarrassment to his church, and I repent of those things, and now I want to come back and ask your forgiveness. He would be more popular than ever. He would not lack for popularity if he did that. Why? Because it would be open. <laughs> It would be honest. It would be authentic. But when we try to save face and lie about our sins to do that, consequences result. Imagine how winsome it is to be open and even sometimes vulnerable about our faults. Imagine a world where people adopted humility and fought against pride, so uh, that uh, fought against pride. So they would feel comfortable asking other people, and I, I'm sorry for the small size of the font, I apologize. But imagine a world where people adopted humility, fought against pride, so they would feel comfortable asking other people for help when they found themselves caught up in sin. They were honest about their own struggles, and they asked other people genuinely and honestly for help. And imagine a place where those other people that they were asking, where they were humble enough to realize that we all sin, and that, that judging someone else before helping them really isn't very productive. Imagine a world like that. Imagine a world where we never minimize our sins and take full responsibility for our actions. Imagine where we immediately apologize and ask forgiveness from people that we've wronged. Or where we understand the message of the cross and we refuse to punish ourselves for a guilty conscience. Imagine a place where our lives have fewer complications because we stop putting things ahead of God. Imagine a world like this. Now the thing is, I'm not asking you to imagine a world that's an impossible ideal. I'm not asking you to imagine a world where everything is perfect, where nothing bad ever happens, where we're all perfect people and we all live according to the righteous standards of God and we never make mistakes and we never mess up. I'm not asking for that. I'm just asking for a world where we're more honest, where we're more open and more authentic. Imagine what a world that would be. A better world, better relationships, fewer fights and arguments, fewer problems, a more authentic life, a more productive life. I didn't say perfect, I said better. That is not an impossible world. That is not an unreachable ideal. That is not something that only exists in our imagination. It is a world that is consistent with the teachings of scripture. And it's also realistic enough to acknowledge that, you know, in spite of our best efforts, we do sin and we do fall short of God's standards. But Imagine this. Imagine this. Now, this takes work, 
And I think that's why Paul writes about putting on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. Because when you look at some of the things that he's talking about there, he is talking about a struggle. He is talking about conflict. And that's what happens when you and I are in spiritual battle against sin and against anything that, is, that comes from the kingdom of Satan. It is a struggle. And so I'm going to give all of us a challenge this week, myself included. Give all of us a challenge this week. I want all of us to go through all of the items of the armor of God. There are six of them, so you've got one item per day until next Sunday. So go through each one of these items, each one of them, and make, make your list. Write down how each one can be used to combat sin in your life and my life. Just take one item per day. Maybe if you already do a morning devotional, use this as a, some devotional time to, to, to contemplate, to meditate on God's word, to, to think about some things that would improve our daily living. Uh, there, there's a positive consequence of this. Just take one each day, maybe around breakfast time. That's a, that's a good time of day to do it, to start. Start your day off right, on the, on the right foot. And take that time, take that one item, and think about how that could impact your struggle against sin how that could make you a better citizen of God's kingdom we're all sinners but the thing is we have a great savior and such a great salvation is it is within the reach of every single person if we will reach out and take it there may be someone here tonight who needs to do that for the first time. Right? You, need to, you need to recognize that Christ is your Savior, acknowledge that fact, and take the appropriate steps so that you can be added to his church. Giving him your life, confessing sin, repenting of sin, uh, putting your faith and trust in him and his work on the cross, and being baptized for the forgiveness of the sins that you and I have committed. Um, there may be someone who needs to come to Christ after a little bit of time away, and so you need to come back to him the next time. And so there may be an opportunity tonight for somebody to do that. Uh, if it's a, of a nature where you feel like you need to publicly acknowledge um, something that you've done, um, let me say that we would gladly welcome the opportunity to comfort and console a brother or sister in Christ. There may be someone here tonight who just wants to add something to the prayer list. You want to ask for prayers, uh, something that maybe didn't get mentioned today, and, and you'd like to, to announce that so that we, the rest of us can be praying with you and for you. Uh, but whatever you, you need, we want you to let us know about it, really, while we stand and sing.
please join me. Our Father, we come to you thanking you for this beautiful day. Though some will see the weather as oppressive, we should see it as a gift. The alternatives are not so easily accepted. But you have brought us so many blessings in various forms. How can we go into our week with any other idea except that your goodness is supreme over everything? And we are the fortunate ones to receive your blessings. We pray that through Jesus, we may be the people who are true light and salt in the world as we go forward through our week. And Father, that we will be the people who face things and remember that we are ambassadors for your son. That we are the ones who should be the bigger people. We are the ones who should look at the failures and the evils of this world and say, no, I will be different. I will do what the son of God wants from me even if it hurts, even if I lose out. Father, make us strong enough to have such conviction and live it every day. We thank you through Jesus. Amen.